So in Module 5, Lecture 2, we talked about how these large-scale digital corpora, textual corpora, allow us to get beyond cherry-picking particular passages to support our claims and actually get a big picture of general trends in a huge corpus that would be too large for an individual to go through and read. What we're going to talk about here in Lecture 3 is a very similar phenomenon where databases, so large-scale databases of cross-cultural data, so in one time slice but across cultures, or historical databases, so databases that go back in time, can allow us to get a big picture view of the diversity, cultural diversity across the world or through history, and use that big view to document claims about the functional effects of religion. So earlier we've talked about some of these functional theories and some of these functionalists. So Shunzi, the third century BC Confucian thinker, is probably the first functionalist thinker. Ideas about the function of religious ritual in bringing societies together and helping to coordinate people, allow them to understand where their place is in society and how society works. Shunzi is supporting his arguments with anecdotal evidence and in some cases made up evidence of myths he has about the creation of society. Uh, later functionalists, people like Durkheim, are trying to get a little bit more rigorous about the data that they're using to support their theory. So Durkheim is drawing on ethnographies, uh, particularly of Australia, so he's got evidence. But again, it looks a lot like the kind of textual evidence we were talking about in the last lecture where he's cherry-picking examples that support his theory. He's got no way to really rigorously demonstrate that the evidence he's presenting to us is representative of cross-cultural variation or historical variation. It's very difficult for any one individual to do this. So making a claim about large trends across the world requires you, if you're going to do it responsibly, to have knowledge of all of these traditions throughout their entire history. This is really almost essentially impossible for one individual to do. The one exception I could think of is the late Robert Bella's last book, Religion and Human Evolution, where he's covering major civilizations of the world. He's got an incredibly impressive coverage of East Asia, of China, of South Asia, but this is because he was an incredibly prolific and hardworking scholar. I actually spoke to him not long before he passed away and he told me he spent essentially a decade getting up to speed on South Asia. So he spent a decade of his life having to read everything he could get his hands on in South Asia in order to, in his view, make a responsible claim about the way that religion functioned in South Asian society. There are other ways to do this. So one in heroic individual can try to do this on their own. We also have other resources. So we have databases now, various types of databases that can allow us to get a big picture view of human cultural variation and change over time. So the databases that have been used by scholars in the field of cognitive science of religion are primarily cross-cultural databases, and the two main ones are HRAF, sometimes pronounced HRAF, the Human Relation Areas Files. This is a, a fairly old one, it's been around since the 60s and is now online, and also the Standard Cross-Cultural Sample, or SCCS. So these are large-scale, essentially anthropological databases that are documenting cultural variation, cultural features of cultures from all over the world. So there have been several studies in our field that have used these databases to look at theories in the cognitive science of religion. So for instance, Dominic Johnson in 2005 piece used the SCCS to document the correlation of moralizing high gods with various measures of social cooperation that he's, he's pulling from the standard cross-cultural sample. Richard Sosas published a paper called Scars for Wars in 2007, where he documented a correlation in HRAF between increased intensity of warfare and increased likelihood to adopt scarification procedures, so these painful rituals where pe people scarify themselves. And this is precisely what you'd predict if you thought that these rituals were serving a function in tying people together more effectively so they could compete against their enemies. Now, CSR scholars use these databases because they're pre-existing, they're out there already, but there are limitations to these databases. So one is that they tend to be synchronic. So in other words, they're giving you just one time slice. There's no historical depth to them. You're getting one bit of data about a particular culture. You don't know anything about how that culture changed over time. 
And this is problematic if you have some kind of theory about cultural evolution, where you've got to be telling a story about how cultures change over time. Another problem is that because the data was gathered by a variety of ethnographers, so it's drawn out of ethnographies, you don't always have the variables that you want. So you may want to know something about a particular society, but the ethnographer wasn't interested in that topic and didn't gather any data on it. Another problem is that the way in which the variables are defined may not be precisely how you would want to define them. So for instance, the existence or non-existence of a high god, a supreme high god. The problem is this is defined very specifically. It involves creation, so a god who's involved in creating the cosmos, which is a very kind of culturally specific Abrahamic. I mean, in a sense, you're saying, is it an Abrahamic god? So in some ways, some of these variables are not as useful as they could have been because they were defined in a particular way. So what do you do in response to this? One response is to just create your own custom databases. So this is what some scholars have done. A good example of this is a study by Sosis and Bressler in 2003, where they were interested in testing the, the costly display hypothesis. So the idea that costly displays bind people together more effectively against the evolution of 19th century United States communes. So they were looking at utopian communes. So they actually created their own database of 83 communes from the 19th century. And some were religious, some were secular, and found that perhaps counterintuitively, the communes that imposed more demands on their members lasted longer. So the ones that typically the religious ones who made their members fast or observe various religious strictures outlive ones that did not do this. They found some support here for the idea that forcing your members to signal in a costly way their solidarity with the group, their membership in the group, actually helps that group survive over time. One of the more ambitious examples of a database, custom database, built to test theories about religion specifically, is the Pelotu database of Pacific religion. So this was created by a team in New Zealand and covers a vast number of these Austronesian cultures. So we're going to talk to two of the directors of this project, Russell Gray and Quentin Atkinson, to learn a little bit about the how they put this database together and what sort of questions about religion they've been able to answer using the database. This was a database that we set up, I guess it was motivated by this interest we have in testing hypotheses about the potential functional role of religion in societies by looking at cross-cultural variation in religious features it turns out that the Pacific is a really good place to test some of these theories. And the reason for that is that you've got hundreds of different islands occupied by different groups, all with slightly different cultural, societal, socioeconomic, mode of subsistence characteristics, and also a whole lot of religious variation as well. Mm -hmm. And they're like little independent mini experiments that have been running for a few hundred years since these islands were initially settled. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a natural experiment you can take advantage of. Yeah, exactly. And so what we wanted to do was document religious variation across these islands. And along with that, some of the features of the societies where we found this religious variation. So to do that, we built this cross-cultural religious database, Pulotu. Pilotu comes from a Proto-Polynesian word for abode of the gods. So the information is gleaned from often anthropologists, but also some early explorer accounts. And then there are a couple of kind of later phases looking at the impact of missionary activity, and then more recently, the, the kind of current state of these mm -hmm. societies. So what sort of hypotheses about religious cultural development or the connection between religious practices and beliefs and cultural forms can you test once you ha have a database like this? Well, God was kind to anthropologists, really, when he invented <laughs> the Pacific because it's laid out kind of geographically and also there was this expansion of people out of Taiwan through the Philippines, Borneo, Sulawesi and Indonesia that plays out across that landscape. So you get both space and, and time. And I think the really critical thing is we can test causal hypotheses. So in lots of sort of macro cultural evolution studies, people have correlations. They yeah. find correlations, say, between big gods and, and big societies. And we're able to test kind of causal claims. Do you first get the evolution of big gods and then get the evolution of kind of big societies? That's a sort of particular causal claim. And so we've been able to test that in the Pacific because the language family trees gives us that, 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 that history. Yeah. yeah. 
And when we do that, we see that actually big societies tend to evolve first, and we use the tree actually to infer borrowing. We think the notion of a moralizing higher God actually diffused in, in the societies that had contact with Muslim traders. Yeah. So that, that paper supported the notion that moralizing gods play a kind of causal role in driving the evolution of political complexity, just not big gods. Right, so you get moralizing gods first. First, yeah. yes. And, and, and lots of them. And actually, chiefs uh, and elites are quite skilled at deploying not just a single god, but multiplicities of gods. So Hawaiian chiefs you know, would physically embody various gods, like such as Ku, the Hawaiian god of war, and use that to kind of coordinate large-scale social groups. You don't need big gods to make a big society, but you need moralizing ones that enforce social norms. So the Pelotu database is a very impressive project, but it does have its own limitations. So one of the obvious ones is just geographic. It's only looking at the Pacific. The other is it is, it is primarily just one time slice. So they have a little bit of temporal depth because they're looking uh, pre-missionary contact and post-missionary contact. But they don't have a lot of historical depth, and this is just because of the natures of the societies involved. So one of the projects that we've been working on at UBC is creating a, a massive database called the Database of Religious History that will actually cover the entire globe and go back in time, back to the earliest archaeological records. We're sourcing the data from experts themselves, and this is crucial. So one of the problems with dealing with large-scale societies, so when really large-scale societies like China or the Roman Empire, is that you can't really code these societies yourself. You can't, as an outsider, learn all of the scholarship and all of the primary languages you would need to do this responsibly. You've got to go to the historians themselves. And so what we've ended up doing is creating a kind of online resource that historians can use for their own purposes. So a way to create teaching materials, to share various bits of research, but one that will also involve them answering a questionnaire about certain features where they're answering yes, no, field doesn't know. In other words, creating quantitative answers to these questions. So it gives us the kind of quantitative data that you have in something like HRAF or the SCCS, but for historical religion. People are answering questions about religious groups or religious features or maybe particular gods or a certain type of ritual, but all of the answers, no matter what the tags, it's all anchored in space and time. And this allows the data in the DRH to be analyzed in an incredibly flexible manner and also correlated with any other kind of data that's anchored in the same way in space and time. For you as a student of religion, the DRH can be an incredible resource. It's open to the public. Only experts can contribute, but anyone can browse or search the DRH. And this gives you a way to actually learn about religions you might not know about. and gives it you the information in a kind of standardized form that can help you compare religions from across the world or see how particular religious traditions have changed over time. So in terms of the quantitative aspects of the DRH, the long-term goal is to be able to have this data about religious history communicating with other sorts of data. So be able to correlate it with data about politics, about economics, about warfare, about climate. So we're constructing it in such a way that you will be able to, in an analysis, have it talk to other databases. So this goal of correlating disparate data, data about lots of different aspects of history, brings us to the final project I want to mention, which is called D-Place. So this is a project that's, again, synchronic, so it's mostly from one time slice in terms of the data, but it's an attempt to bring together data from all over the world and a large variety of data. So data about religion, but also data about climate, politics, warfare. So D-Place is actually already being used to answer questions about religion. So very briefly, we're going to go back to Russell Gray again, who is the director of PLOTU, but also a central figure in D-Place, to talk about how they've used D-Place to study the relationship between religion and ecology. D-Place, yeah, it's a really fun project. What it does, it brings together cross-cultural data, uh, about uh, 1,600 cultures, with about 70-odd cultural variables, uh, and it ties that to language trees, and it ties it to fine-grained environmental data. Uh, so we can use that, for example, to test whether your notion of God varies with your ecology. Mm -hmm. So we wrote this paper on the, the ecology of religious beliefs. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, what we're interested in doing is not testing kind of single-factor explanations, but whether a combination of factors, how they might interact. And we, we look, we had two main measures of the environment, how harsh the environment was and how uncertain the environment was. And what we found is that it was much more common to have 
a high god, a moralizing high god, uh, in places where the environment was harsh or where it was unpredictable. And I guess there's two ways you can interpret that result. Psychologically, that this is people's kind of response to, to life being tough or uncertainty, sort of an existential type response. Or you could interpret it in those kind of environments, you need things that promote pro-sociality. So I think it's a really exciting time. We're just getting started with these big database projects. Yeah. And hopefully if everyone, you know, just plays well, yeah. uh, these things yeah. can be connected up in, in a way that means that the like future generations of students will just have an awful lot more kind of tools. And therefore, much better ability to answer all these kind of questions.